morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we've been doing these free mentoring sessions for years and years and years. This is the 387th session. Um, we started doing them in the fall of 2008. So it's 10 years of consistent, unfailing commitment to uh, doing these. And uh, along the way, this is the experiment that led us to launching the full-fledged 1 million by 1 million program back in 2010. So um, the event is being recorded. You'll find the recording on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. And you'll find all recordings there, all our recordings and other video content as well. So feel free to use that as one of your learning devices. If you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. Our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and at Romana. You may be following us already, or if you're not, we do publish a lot of very interesting and rich content. So do follow us. Now, this is a round table, not a broadcast, so we want you to participate. I will put the slides back up a bit later. We have some, uh, you know, scheduled programming first, and then it will be open. The line will be open for open Q&A discussions. Um, any issues that you want to bring up, you want to converse about, you're welcome to use the phone line to dial in. We're going to start today with a conversation with Nate Redmond. Managing Partner of Alpha Edison in Southern California. Nate, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Nate, tell our audience about Alpha Edison and yourself. Just let's, uh, you know, introduce you to the audience. And, of course, for me also, some catching up because the last time we spoke, you were doing something else and you were in the middle of putting this new thing together. So, let's catch up. Uh, I'll Thank you so much. So Alf Edison is a firm, new firm. Uh, we're about two years old. And it, the, uh, the focus and how we invest is really a function of the type of business model innovation that we look at. So unlike most investors, most venture capital investors who tend to look for and focus on either sector uh, expertise, so for example, digital media or fintech, or they look at um, kind of technology waves, for example, mobile. Um, our belief is that these have ceased to become real sources of differentiated insight. And instead, we look through much more horizontal lenses that cut across traditional sectors. Um, and end up really driving and shaping business model innovation. And the power of that business model innovation is that it allows you to unlock new markets. And unlocking those markets uh, is really the power of long-term sustainable growth. So that's um, an abstraction. Can we double-click down and work on a example that illustrates the philosophy that you just outlined? I think that would be helpful. So, you know, when we started the firm, we really set out to answer a very specific, simple question uh, with a complex answer, which is, why is it that most investors miss most of their best opportunities? And so an investor is known and, and uh, has been very successful largely on the basis for a small number of investments that they've made and companies that they've been part of building. And yet, if you look back through their career, um, despite having invested in two or three companies that went on to be very successful, they actually saw another 10 or, or 12 or 15 or 20 that were equally, if not um, more successful. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's partly a byproduct of the fact that you see many, many companies as an investor. But you turn it around and look at a company like Airbnb, 
And why is it that so many investors saw and yet didn't have conviction in order to move forward and make an investment? Of course, as you move forward and things become obvious, uh, it's reflected in the price. Um, even for those who came in and billion dollar plus valuation, that was a, a smart move. But we really focus on the earlier stages. And when you look at a company like Airbnb, it's, you know, it's very easy uh, when you're kind of sitting 10 years later to look at uh, how obvious things seem today. But when you mm -hmm. roll back to when, um, when this team really started the company, you know, it was clear that they were looking at a market of, of uh, hospitality that was quite significant. Yet, if you look at the behaviors that they were targeting, these behaviors mm -hmm. were really required an individual to come into a home with a, someone who they didn't know and uh, to stay probably on an airbed. And as such, it was a uh, behavior that really appealed to or fit for a very narrow slice of the population. Consequently, um, investors, including myself, sat and looked at the company and didn't quite understand the size and scope of the opportunity. And it wasn't uh -huh. because the, you know, being an investor in, or an expert in hospitality didn't necessarily help you. In fact, it probably created blind spots. So the, the area and the focus for us is really understanding how, in this case, the business model around in a marketplace, more specifically around how you can engage a, a supply base, organize it to really unlock a large portion of latent demand. And in order to unlock that latent demand, it really requires understanding the types of behaviors that people would like to engage in, would like to perform, and yet aren't because they're otherwise constrained. In the case of Airbnb, one of the most important elements that unlocked that behavior was a sense of trust. And so, mm -hmm. for example, trust for us has become one of these foundational layers and lenses that we look through to really understand how is it that you can establish and build trust once you do within the context of the market that you're going after, let's say financial services or health, um, what types of behaviors, new behaviors emerge, and what does that allow you to do in terms of reshaping the business model within that industry? So, so that means that you are looking for markets, uh, to take the Airbnb example, where trust was obvious in a very small segment. The larger, you know, the broadening of that trust equation took time, and, and you are committing to extrapolating and, and uh, you know, thinking through that trust equation on a longer term basis. Yeah, that's exactly right. And when we look at the, you know, the lack of trust that existed within the context of any one of us individually going into someone's home who we did not know, and the, the framework through which we can begin to um, establish and build that trust through rating systems, through the way in which uh, Joe and the team really developed and built product, allows us to begin to understand and estimate the, the scope of the market opportunity that exists if you're able to establish and build that trust. And, um, and again, for us, this is less about actually going in and taking share from incumbents. That's, well, that's always part of it. What actually drives the long-term sustainable growth is much more unlocking uh, this be, these you behaviors. Value. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so for example, again, using ride sharing as, um, as a framework, you know, before Uber and Lyft, et cetera, began, again, let's roll back 10 years, the total spend in the Bay Area on taxi and limousines was $140 million. Last year, already more than a billion dollars was spent in the Bay Area across ride sharing. And so this is not 
a growth curve that is reflective of just going in and taking share. It turns out that a lot of people wanted to move from point A to point B without driving. And consequently, they either previously drove themselves with a set of frustrations or they just didn't go at all. And mm -hmm. by removing friction, by creating trust within the system, you actually unlocked a set of behaviors that, that um, colored and, and described a market that was much bigger than people realized. And that, just to tie the loop on it, that, that failure to understand the size of the market opportunity oftentimes mm -hmm. causes investors not to have conviction as to sure. why Airbnb could be large and therefore miss most of their best opportunities. Yeah. So that tells me that you are focusing mostly on B2C. Is that a correct observation? So consumer businesses clearly have an application of this, but we've also found that there are many uh, business-oriented companies that are servicing businesses that also, the, you know, their customers fundamentally uh, are servicing consumers and or the changing behaviors of the underlying consumers actually shape and reshape the, the markets that they're targeting. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I'm, I have invested um, previously, I was with a firm called Rustic Canyon. Um, in that time, I invested in a company called Gaikai. Gaikai had looked at the changing dynamics of, of streaming, enabling very different modes of gameplay. Of course, that's fairly obvious today. Um, at that time, it was less obvious. That shift in the enabling technology, but fundamentally shaped by the desire by individuals to play um, interactive entertainment, fundamentally games, without requiring a, you know, that to be loaded onto your computer or to your Xbox, et cetera, but really to be played online, was what drove it, even though a company like Gaikai really sold through large partners like um, Sony and LG. Mm -hmm. Nate, uh, what about uh, stage? What, um, what are you looking to see? Are you investing in concepts? Are you investing in a little bit of something, a little bit of traction? What, uh, what is comfortable? So, you know, stage has been a, a segmentation that many investors use that is, I think, reflective of a type of, of process, both in terms of sourcing and an understanding of a business. Um, we are early stage investors. By that we mean we tend to be investors in the first, or we are the first in, institutional investors in a company. Um, in, in many cases, this company will have raised angel and or seed money. Um, in some cases, that will have been called a seed round. In some cases, it will have been called an aid round. But most importantly for us is really understanding the type of risk that, that describes where this company is and the type of risk that we really want to own at this stage. Um, so we aren't religious about it being called a Series A. Um, we are really focused on partnering deeply with an entrepreneur in a way that um, we seek to become that entrepreneur's first call. Um, so it's fun. But uh, my, well. question is, my question is more about what do you want to see in terms of validation to be okay with investing in a company? Yeah, so it's, it's really not about, you know, any one specific set of metrics. If you're a company that is, going in and targeting consumers in financial services, there are, we have a very specific thesis. Um, when we talk about trust, trust is evident by things such as very high NPS, um, very low churn. And those are important. Obviously, I, NPS affords you the opportunity to build mm -hmm. a, a base of customers without spending lots of money on marketing. Um, very low churn, create this long-term durable relationship. So that having that context, um, we will focus more on those metrics and looking at the um, long-term establishment and, and creation of value. 
as opposed to what's the trailing month over month growth, which frankly, anyone's fresh out of school can look at and um, you know, make an early assessment. And that differs, Srana, from you know, the way in which we would think about a, you know, a business in a, you know, in a very different space. So, you know, clearly it is more important to understand how the pace of learning for an entrepreneur, for a company, the, mm -hmm. um, the mode in de of development, and how that maps to the long-term vision. You know, we've spent mm -hmm. a lot of time and effort and work around in our focus on business model innovation on how we understand the full potential of the business and the mm -hmm. path by which we can unlock that full potential. Okay. What about fund size and check size? How big is Alpha Edison and what size checks are you comfortable writing? So we really in, will invest, our kind of core investments tend to be somewhere between two and $10 million. Um, those aren't hard ranges, only to kind of provide a bracket and a uh, set of areas of focus. Sometimes we come in a little earlier um, with a very clear thesis on um, how we begin to unlock that upside. If we do come in earlier, it's with the hope and intent that we can um, lead the subsequent round and, and do so in a way that um, is, is consistent with the execution pace and, um, and our thesis, are, again, around how you will unlock that upside. Um, and so, you know, we are, um, that maps back to the notion of being early stage investors. How big is the fund? Uh, 175. 175 million. And geography. You are based in Southern California. Is the investment preference also Southern California, or do you have a broader preference? We are based in Southern California. That really does afford us a view and a set of, of uh, opportunities to dig in around Los Angeles. That said, we are not a regional fund. Um, we actually don't believe that regional strategies are, are sustainable over the long term uh, as a point of differentiation. And instead, we have uh, really looked through these lenses at the very best companies um, uh, reflective of our theses. So we have investments in Los Angeles. We also have in San Francisco, in New York, um, and Seattle to date. Okay. Talk about some of the highlights of your portfolio. What have you invested in that you're excited about right now? Um, well, you know, we're a new firm, so we are uh, we're excited and have fortune have been fortunate to watch the real development of and the early development of our portfolio. Um, you know, there's there's a company called House Canary in San Francisco which I'll mention in that they, you know, we have a belief and a thesis that, that uh, residential real estate, which as an asset class is larger than uh, equities in the United States, is mm -hmm. one that um, despite its size and um, fragmentation, or perhaps because of it, has a, a um, level of opacity that is fundamentally different than what you would see in the equity or credit markets where transparency has come. And as transparency has come to those markets, transparency around pricing of an underlying security, of how to trade those securities, of how to actually transact, and the friction has come down, you've seen a very significant increase in, in velocity of transactions. Mm -hmm. So when you look at residential real estate, the behaviors that people have exhibited around how frequently they move and um, the strategies that they take to to manage that uh, home has been you know has really not changed over the last 25 years. And at its core is the fact that very few people really understand what their home is worth. So if you start by building a, a clear sense of value of that home you can begin to not just chip at the edges of, of uh, you know, improving the existing process, but actually begin to rewire the entire transaction process. 
And that's what House Canary set out to do. Um, and, you know, we are incredibly excited about the long-term prospects for the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look back, are you been doing this fund now for two years with this investment thesis? Um, what have you seen in the deal flow that could be uh, called trend lines? What are the um, you, what are the dynamics of your deal flow? And what does that say about the industry? So again, we came in with a, a thesis based off of the last 15 years that um, most investors have sought to differentiate themselves on the basis of access. And while access remains very important, it's no longer sufficient to really drive uh, differentiated insight and performance. So in other words, the fact that you could see Airbnb was important, but it turns out lots of people saw Airbnb. So actually just having access wasn't the core differentiator. It was really having a, a, a strong enough point of view around where this company could go and how it could emerge that actually shaped the, the long-term performance and was reflected in this case of, of Sequoia having the conviction to move early. When, um, when we looked at our deal flow, you know, one of the dynamics that's changed across the venture capital industry, and it's important just to understand for entrepreneurs, is that, you know, it's similar to the way in which our email inboxes have changed over the last decade, where you've had almost an order of magnitude increase in terms of the number of things that are hitting your inbox. Uh, similarly, you have just an explosion in terms of the number of, of companies. For most people, and most firms, that causes a, those, those sort of standard traditional filters to just become overwhelmed. The byproduct of that, of course, is that most people fall back on these heuristics on, gosh, I'd love to talk to you. Can you just make sure you get a recommendation for someone I know? Or if you get introduced by a CEO in our portfolio, then I'll focus and take a look. Um, you know, that's an easy point to rely on. We believe that that causes you not only to miss really important um, developing opportunities, but frankly causes the investment uh, process to tend to uh, focus back in on, you know, people who are introduced tend to be like you. Most VCs are white males. And therefore, most entrepreneurs who get in, introduced by their friends are white males. And um, so we're really focusing, Shimona, on different ways of opening up the top end of our funnel and having a very efficient and effective manner by which we can work through a, uh, a process to really engage a much broader array of entrepreneurs. So do you have a uh, layer of... Um principals or associates who are fielding a much larger inflow of deals? We do have a, a really incredibly talented team that we've begun building. Um, but we've also, a lot of this is a focus on, on systems because, you know, people reach their scale limits very quickly. And, um, and you know, the judgment that we're uh, developing is one that, that we're really intending to accentuate and to accelerate through the systems that we have. Yeah. It's actually, uh, unfortunately, the industry is very, very um, hard to break into for people who are, you know, completely coming cold into it from random outskirts and find their way in. So we we definitely try to bridge that problem for our entrepreneurs, and and our entrepreneurs are not just white male at all. It's very very diverse uh, community. So yes, Nate, and, uh, I, and, ask, and I've always had a just to be clear, I've always had a lot of respect for um, for that and for the the community that's that you've um, collectively built here. So. Uh, it's really wonderful to be a part of it. Thank you. So, Nate, um, comment on unicorn mania for me. Um, mm. We just kind of went a little bit crazy with this 
concept of unicorns and then everybody needed to be a unicorn and blah, blah, blah. it's just a very unfortunate twist that the industry has taken. How do you park unicorn mania? Well, look, you know, unicorn status, if you will, became a marker of success that obviously is is artificial in many ways in that and there's and flawed and it, you know it's it's certainly evident of developing one measure of value which is reflective of a an investor or a group of investors willingness to buy shares at a price clearly it doesn't necessarily translate to long-term uh, economic value um, it can um, but it's the correlation is lower than you would otherwise think and expect. Or said differently, the failure rate of unicorns is much higher than people realize. And um, one of the things that got embedded within a lot of unicorn media was in a company's attempt to reach for this milestone, they were willing to trade off, um, you know, the type of investor, the way in which that investor engaged, the structure of the deal that they made with that investor, meaning both, you know, heavy preferences that are put on top and or mm -hmm. the type of, of negative controls that this uh, investor or group of investors has, um, you know, the ratchet that it may occur at a time of a public offering, et cetera. Like the list goes on. Very, and, and so, you know, a lot of those dynamics are unhealthy. Clearly it's unhealthy for people to become um, so heavily focused on, you know, this, this sort of individual time marker value, whereas this long-term economic value is really what, what matters. Um, you know, that said, the lists continue and people, and, you know, the nomenclature continues within the press, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. No, it's not so it going exists, away at all. It but you are looking measure, for these outsized returns though, right? You're not looking for the niche opportunities. Well, look, I, I think the dynamics of, of invest, of growth investing, by the way, it's not just venture capital, it's not just seed investing, it's not just early stage or later stage, it's all growth investing, including public markets, is that the power law that is significant and applies across the returns, meaning a few things make up nearly all of the returns for a fund, for a firm, for, um, you know, again, the same thing for public growth funds. And um, given that, you will always, as an investor, be interested in understanding what company really could be that outside driver. In fact, every venture firm will say, you know, we really only focus on companies that can emerge that way. And that's sort of a byproduct of the notion of a firm, a fund. Now, if you had a structure whereby you were really looking at investments on an individual by individual basis, that may begin to change. I think the importance of the work that we are doing uh, in really rethinking markets is that the, the power of a niche, for example, to go back to what we talked about on Airbnb, is that you know, here they were going after and targeting a very specific behaviorally, not strategically, behaviorally targeting a very niche segment that turned out to be a very large segment. And yeah. what they needed to do was through, through different systems, establishing and unlocking that trust so you could unlock this behavior. And that's what, uh, to me, becomes the bridge between someone who believes they're really going after a niche we are really looking to understand how that niche actually is, is representative of a much larger segment of the population that not yet has um, exhibited that type of behavior. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of niches. And part of it is also there are the two ways to look at niches, right? There are right now in the industry, there are some six, 700 micro VCs you know, small funds, $10 million funds, $15 million funds, $50 million funds who are in a position to invest in niches and actually make 3x, 4x on niches because there is a lot of acquisition opportunity. There are tons of 
you know, especially in SaaS, there's a ton of companies that could okay. acquire to grow and, and stuff like that. So there's there are exit opportunities within those niches and so forth. So and there's a fund size abundance of fund size uh, fit in that segment. So that's one way to play a niche, and the other way to play a niche is the way you're playing it or proposing to play it, which is to start with a niche and then be able to systematically broaden the niche into a more mainstream, much larger market opportunity. So I think either way you look at it, niche is a very important piece of how to build a company, a very important strategic move in how to build a company. Yeah, and to be clear, look, again, we also believe niches are really important and that you can go in, have a very specific understanding and target and and overserve that customer group by which we mean really in creating delight that causes those customers to really become um, you know your ambassadors as you go out and there's a a weighting that most investors and um, and sort of the broader ecosystem of entrepreneurs put against some understanding of TAN the total addressable market which uh, you know, when an entrepreneur comes in and says, here's a trillion dollar market, my first reaction is you don't understand your market. That's because right. that, That's that right. notion of describing a TAM, that, you know, you've missed the segmentation. So come in and have a very deep understanding of a very specific target. And then for us, we're going to look to understand how that target provides, you overserve that target market you're now in a position to go do what? And that these nested if-thens create the framework through which you really unlock the full potential of the company. Very good. Nate, thank you for uh, being with us today and sharing your insights and uh, look forward to working with you on something uh, soon. I look forward to it as well. Thank you so much. Folks, audience, we're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session. Um, let me set a bit of expectations here. Remember, this is a working session. You know, we are here to work on your strategy and help you put one step before the other, one foot before the other, and make some progress. That's the only purpose of these sessions. So you can feel safe. You don't need to feel guarded or defensive or apologetic. Just be candid and let's just have an honest, candid discussion on how can we help you remove your load roadblocks, how can you strategize to move forward. Now, one thing you will need to remember, you can disagree with my feedback here, that's no problem. It's your venture, you are going to eventually decide on what strategy you're gonna follow. But do remember that not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money does not guarantee success. So with that, we're going to start with Carmel Larson. Carmel, please uh, unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Thank you for having me today, Sarana. It's nice to meet you. I'm Carmel nice to Larson, the founder of Momni. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. So most of you, I'm sure, especially after hearing from your guests, have you talked a lot about Airbnb and Uber, so everyone's familiar with ride sharing and room sharing. Well, Mommy is a sharing economy solution to child care, and we call it care sharing. Go ahead and advance. So single moms, working moms, moms in college especially, often drop out with a lack of child care. In the U.S., 26% of families are led by single parent homes, number one in the world for single parent homes. And the child care crisis is actually a global child care crisis recognized in almost every nation of the world currently. And in addition to where we're at today, the UN predicts that over the next decade, one billion women will enter the workforce. So who will care for all of these children? Advance. Momni proposes an enormous solution for a huge market sector. The, the entire US market is a $48 billion industry. That's for the entire childcare sector. But we're not attempting to go after the uh, 
or to, to be a replacement for the daycare industry or full-time nannies. Rather, mom needs a solution for the occasional needs in addition to the full-time needs. So there's 22 million families that have children 12 and under in the U.S. And assuming that most families would need care for about three hours here and there once a week, they would use an additional mommy for their crisis situations or just to go out or random needs or taking a test. It's a $3.4 billion market okay. that we're targeting. Our revenue model is patterned after successful sharing economies. We keep a rev we keep 15% of the host fees. So the mommy hosts who bring children into their home, these uh, mostly mothers, although mommy is as much for dads as it is for moms. Anyone can become a mommy, though our strategy is focused on moms. So the 15% of the host fees, we have a break even at two and a half years and, and uh, project a 60 million in revenue by year five. Are you talking about 60 million in your revenue? That is the 15% becomes yeah. 60 million or are you talking about the gross? number? Our revenue, the 15%. 15%, okay, good. Yes. All right. The interesting thing about the competitive landscape currently is that most of the solutions currently available to the child care crisis are connecting parents to babysitters, nannies, and daycares. The problem with the child care crisis is a supply issue. So mommy is going to win because we're taking this latent supply, massive supply of mothers who are already set up for childcare in their homes and connecting them with each other, which is actually mm -hmm. what moms have been doing for the beginning of time, is connecting with each other to help one another. Our key differentiators mm -hmm. are that we take trust and security to a, a whole new level with the background checks, not just for the host, but for all adults in the home. We have a gesture selfie. We do face um, identity match with government ID, and we have secured a million dollar insurance coverage for both the host and guest guarantee. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and advance. We launched in March, or well, I say should say we started in March of 2017. So almost a year mm -hmm. ago, I founder financed $115,000, which brought us to a working prototype. We did mm -hmm. get to, to revenue in 2017 with a pre beta, and just two weeks ago, we launched an actual. Uh, private data in Utah, in Utah County and Salt Lake County. So we're just getting started with our traction with actual users. Okay. Uh, so right now, you say got to revenue in 2017. What kind of revenue have you gotten to? What's the revenue level? It was just, it was just with a handful of uh, a pre-beta group that was helping us uh, figure out some of the early issues with okay. the technology. It's very small. Okay. So we're just getting into the real revenue now. Our growth strategy relies upon this natural instinct of mothers and women. From the beginning of time, they've gathered into groups to help one another. And so our go-to-market go strategy is to use that power to have, invite the, the women to, um, to invite through care sharing credits and a 5% revenue sharing model to invite all of the people that they know in their circles of trust to join the technology. So the book clubs, church groups, military wife groups are really excited about this. In our research, and it's just obvious to everyone who hears this, no one's going to share or drop their child off to a stranger. We don't anticipate that um, anyone's going to do that. But they will invite their circles of trusted friends and begin care sharing with those they trust. And then through mm -hmm. ratings, reviews, references, over time, that trust community will grow and super hosts will develop, super mommies. And over time, we anticipate that people will be willing to share, to, to uh, use a mommy of a friend of a friend, or like LinkedIn, their, their circle yeah. of trust will grow. Advance. On our team, myself, I'm a 20-year entrepreneur. I've been in the mom space for um, over 17 years. I've led 13 different organizations for women, most notable mm -hmm. as a multi-million dollar organization that I founded with a team of 40 plus. Diane is um, our lead administrator and she also is a 26 year entrepreneur. Sean Thomas is our developer and he's had two successful exits as a founder and Brad Holland is our graphic designer and over a UX and UI and he was formerly with Infusionsoft. 
Mm-hmm. Again. We're seeking our seed rounds, our first round of investment. We're asking for 1.1 million. We run a very lean startup, so 22% is earmarked for operations, so 33% for development will move us from a prototype to a fully featured product. And the most, most of our, our fund will be used for marketing, especially the care sharing credit, because the moms are telling us they want to share it with their circles of trust. And so we've earmarked a significant portion to allow for that viral mm-hmm. potential. Very good. I like what you're doing. I, I'm surprised that nobody else is doing it because this, is, this seems to be, I mean, we've seen Uber of this and Uber of that for many years now, and, and uh, you're saying that nobody is doing this. That surprises me because it seems like a, one that it does lend itself to that kind of trust building and community building. Well, it is very, it is very needed, yes and uh, it's overdue. This slide just uh, shows some of my history and all of the different organizations that I have led as a leader. Okay. And um, of all the titles, though, that I've been given, the one that I cherish most is that of mother. And um, Are these all your family. children? Yes, I have eight children. And so I'm eight very children. familiar with the pain points of, uh, of uh, child care. Being a and where are you based? I'm in Utah. I'm Utah, actually in Silicon okay. Valley right now because I'm uh, meeting with some advisors, investors down here this week. But normally I'm okay. in Utah. Okay, yes. very good. Utah is, uh, has become a very interesting entrepreneurial community, actually. It is. They call it Silicon Slope there. There's so much tech developing in that area. Have you met uh, Jana of uh, Steels.com yet? Um, can you Utah? say that again? There's a Utah entrepreneur, Jana. Her last name is um, Maureen. Do you remember Jana's last name? It's the company is Steels.com. Jana Francis. There we go. No, uh, she's a I very good entrepreneur, and yes. you'll find a lot uh, in common with her. Oh, wonderful! I'll have to look her up. I believe that was the end, and the rest of the slides we could keep going, but most of those are appendix slides. That okay. Well, I like what you're doing. I think it's. Uh, it's got potential, so uh, what do you need? What help do you need right now from us? Well, I'm, I'm building a really great advisory board right now, and they're giving me a lot of great help and advice. So the, where I'm at is um, I recognize because we just launched our beta that I need to focus on traction. I feel that's really mm-hmm. my only hole right now in being ready to be funded. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm focusing on getting users since we just launched beta, and um, so we're just getting the word out. And um, and with the beta, not only getting users, but getting their feedback. We've already started to get a tremendous um, feedback cycle, screenshots, and ideas from our users to just perfect their experience so that as we grow, it will reduce our churn. Okay. Good. Very good. Good, good presentation, uh, and I think it's got lots of potential, what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to Shenmue. Yes, yes. Does not have a last name. Bottenburg, South Carolina. (laughs) Yes, Shenmue Namaste. Uh, It is an artist name that means Yah is heard. And I thank you guys for your time. I'm a big fan of 1M by M1M. And uh, I I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us just to even sharpen minds. I like to just appeal to, um, you know, the conscious um, about our particular state of affairs that we are um, in a lot of municipalities across the country and even globally, um, I'd like to discuss on how we can create, um, we are actually creating a diversity, equity, and inclusion model um, for municipalities, businesses, and um, hopefully businesses that you guys connect with as well. So it's cultural intelligence versus cultural sensitivity. Cultural intelligence, of course, you see it there is the knowledge of skills related to the art, um, those intellectual achievements as well. Um, next slide. And the awareness is the awareness to the sensitivities related to the arts, intellectual achievements of various diverse groups. Um, a lot of our municipalities, especially in the South, um, are very marginalized and they're very culturally insensitive. And what I mean by that, um, go to the next slide. 
Um, I live in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, it's a population of 30,000 people. Um, and diversity has become a huge buzzword these days. Um, and most municipalities want to show diversity, but not really equipping the people to actually become a true diverse community, um, uh, giving people the right jobs. And I asked the Chamber of Commerce, next slide, please. Uh, at the Chamber of Commerce, um, I was sitting in with, uh, with them, and they created this job called Talent and Inclusion Council. And the focus of that is, uh, is to provide opportunities for minorities and communities. However, they did a poll before they started this hiring process, and out of 30,000 people that live in Spartanburg, 48% of them are African American. So we have a very strong base here. We're just an hour away from Charlotte, which is one of the largest financial districts in the country. Um, and we're two hours away from Atlanta, one of the entertainment capitals in this country. So there's a lot of culture in the area, and there's a lot of resources, aware, but they're not reaching the people that are necessary that really need to pull themselves out the bootstraps. Bootstraps is a term we hear a lot in business, but it's also used a lot in the economic um, diversity world as well. And people are always assuming that individuals could just learn the information, um, but we see huge gaps, huge gaps in our schooling system and internships. There's a huge gap in African Americans in the tech world. Less than 5% of us are continually finding, you know, uh, employment in that area. So we said, okay, we cannot continue to complain. We have to find ways to connect the dots. We're a strong cultural base. There's a strong market for business development in the upstate. How can the two correlate? Next slide, please. Uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina is a very thriving art community. Um, digital art, uh, photography, spoken word. Uh, and we have generated over $21 million in commerce for our area. Now, Spartanburg does not jump off on the map for you, of course, because we're only 30,000. But 21 million from arts is a huge investment from people who are just painting, creating events, um, creating a tourist atmosphere for a city, but those jobs, the, the, the spoils don't go back to the kosher. Instead, they go to the municipalities they demand. So what we said, how can we fill in those gaps? First of all, we have this app that we're creating um, that will speak about hip hop and what we call underground hip hop in a way where, because we don't want to focus on major artists, we want to focus on the local talent. We want to build this model and co opt it to other southern cities and hopefully, you know, over there to California. Uh, we want to teach the kids in the public school system how to use social media to their advantage, become social entrepreneurs. Your numbers must align with your cultural impact. Um, it's, it's a continual. It's a continual rhetoric that you hear a lot, especially in, in media, you know, it's, uh, about race and whatnot, but it's, it's in a discussion where it divides people. This way, it actually brings people together because on different levels, children, professors will understand the culture that a lot of these children are coming from and actually equipping them to be entrepreneurs of the culture that they go from. You, you, everybody understand what I'm saying? Um, in a way, it empowers the youth to help them understand that they do not have to wait for an opportunity for someone to hand you something, but actually you can create that opportunity within your own. And then hopefully they'll be sitting here speaking to you, Ms. Mitria, and, 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 and pitching something of the sort as well. I hope so. Um, I, I, I have not ventured as much into the tech world. I am a political science um, major with a nonprofit administration um, minor. I've developed Age Old, which is a community arts organization where we have been able to, next slide, where we have been able to connect to different levels of government here locally in the area. We've been able to market ourselves digitally, saving us loads of money because we have connections to the photographers. We have connections um, to the videographers. We do our own in-house marketing for our programming because we could not just afford it. And we've used our, our asset is our voice, um, our voice and our own culture, understanding uh, hip-hop can be used in, in ways of learning. Can, so you I, see can, I, um, 
Can I start asking you some questions to see how we can sure, help sure. you? Sure. Can you tell me what, how does this business make money? Whom are you catering to and what are you selling to them? Okay. Um, the way we have made money so far is through donors, local donors, uh, events and programming, um, independent consulting, uh, consulting with the Chamber of Commerce, um, consulting with uh, USD Upstate and our diversity planning and inclusion um, programming. Um, are you a nonprofit? Currently we are, but I'm moving towards the LLC, so I'm, I'm interested in knowing uh, where what's the best place pace, you know, to stay in? Should I stay as a nonprofit? Should I venture into mm -hmm. the LLC market? So and, in that you know, case, if you are in the process of moving from a not-for-profit to a for-profit model, my recommendation to you is to spend a good chunk of time within the next couple of months to learn how to build a for-profit business. You're okay. very welcome to use, um, I will point out the resources that you can use from well, the one million by one million portfolio to do that, but I think your first mm -hmm. order of business right now is to learn some methodology, then map what your expertise is, what your interest and passion is to that, and see what comes out of that of that mapping of your passion, your interest, your expertise to the methodology of how to build a for-profit business. Okay. Um, okay. And that what I, I appreciate that, but what I, what I'm interested in, uh, the question I have is, uh, are there in do your do your mentoring session? This is the first one I'm sat in. Um, is there a possible way I can just be a fly on the wall as well to get? that experience, because there's a lot of language that you guys are expressing today that is not really known in our area. Um, That's right. And I'm, I'm, I'm really open to just getting that information so I can adapt those things. Um, right. I'm a, I'm so if you just hold on for a second, actually, I, I'm going to go next to explaining to everybody how to use one million by one million. So hold your questions for a moment. Okay. Let's spend okay. five minutes on that, and then we'll come back to Q&A, and you can ask me further questions, OK? OK, awesome. So uh, folks, first and foremost, I have a request. I have an ask from you, which is, if you like what we are doing here in one million by one million, please bring serious entrepreneurs into the program. And notice that the word serious is in bold. We, have, we need entrepreneurs who understand that building a company is a lot of work and it takes many years of you know, painstaking work. So everything resource-wise is at 1mby1m.com from our portfolio. Um, you will find a terrific blog. If you just start following the blog, you will learn a lot from the blog. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series, there are 12 volumes of Entrepreneur Journeys books that are all case study based books. So each book has 12 to 16 case studies and you can double click down on each of them and you'll learn a lot from those. Um, every week we have these round tables so you can follow along any of these roundtables, you can come back, keep coming back. You can also find all the recordings of every single roundtable on our YouTube channel. You can learn through that as well. It's a very good body of learning material. Our full acceleration program that includes extensive methodology guidance, a full curriculum that introduces you to the methodology, the vocabulary, the, you know, all the pieces of how you put together a business is covered in the curriculum. We help you with business development. We help you with strategy consulting. We also help you with financing and media relations. So all of that is part of the premium program, the 1M by 1M premium, and that's a $1,000 annual membership fee. I suggest you go to the website and do the self-assessment, which will introduce you to a set of questions that you should ask yourself about your business. And if you get stuck in trying to answer those questions on methodology issues, go sign up for 1M by 1M Basic. That is a curriculum only, $99 a month um, online curriculum, and you can go learn methodology and vocabulary through that. So Shemuel, that may be the best starting point for you. 
spend a couple of yeah. months really immersing yourself in the curriculum and learning the vocabulary, learning the methodology. And then if you feel like it, you can upgrade into the premium program, but I think your starting point may just very well be one and one and basic. So dig around on the website. There are tons of information, what to expect from premium, what to expect from basic, video FAQs, FAQs, where you will learn more about the program, how it works, description of the curriculum. We are a case study oriented program. We have over 800 successful entrepreneurs who have participated in our case study program and offered their insights, their views, their perspectives on how to build a business. So you will learn a lot about what they have done, what has been successful, what has not been successful, and you learn that in case studies and video lectures and video interviews. So you will really be standing on the shoulders of people who have done it before, and that's incredibly valuable. Methodology-wise, we do uh, lean capital-efficient bootstrap startups, and our philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. That's how the industry works. So it's not like we want to do it because this is how we like to do it. This is how the industry operates, and, and that's just the reality of how this industry operates. So um, then we have, you know, you can go to the website, again, look at our coverage of the premium members. The follow-on, uh, you know, all of March, pretty much every week, we have a free roundtable. We have five roundtables in March. And you also have another, you know, five roundtables coming up, uh, five rendezvous coming up. These are in-person rendezvous in Silicon Valley. You're very welcome to attend any of them. These are happening usually at Cafe Boroni at 5 p.m. in Menlo Park. Uh, Maureen, maybe you can put in Cafe Boroni in Menlo Park in the slides so people can see that uh, location as well. But pretty much, uh, usually it is on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. From time to time, we have a bit of tweak in the schedule. We will let you know well in advance if those, there are tweaks, but the regular time is 5 p.m. on Wednesdays. So I believe we have another entrepreneur who has sent his slides. So um, Maureen, do you want to upload the slides? And we can try to accommodate him. We have time. And by the way, folks, we are also willing to take questions at this point. So type in your questions. Make sure you're not sending your questions privately to me or Maureen. You need to send the questions to send to all participants. Make sure you set your public chat to send to all participants. And then put in your questions, and I will answer your questions uh, from the public chat. And we'll also be taking questions from the phone line. And while you're coming up with your questions, and Maureen is uh, getting our um, third entrepreneur to get ready to pitch, we are also, um, let me introduce you to also Irina Patterson. Irina will answer all your questions about the 1M by 1M program. Her email is irina at 1m1m.com. Um, so, you know, by all means, talk to Irina, get all your questions answered. Maureen, I think the video has uh, become unlocked. So, is um, Viraj Sarnaik, are you ready to speak? I don't see you on the panelists list, but you need to dial in to be able to present your slides. Virat Sarnaik, please dial in. The number is 650. You have country code one, and then six five zero four seven nine three two zero eight, and then the access code is six six five six nine two nine eight one. While Viraj is dialing in, folks, um, please feel free to also introduce yourselves in public chat. Tell us who you are, where you're joining from, what brings you here, how can we help you? So. As I said, this is a round table. We want to get to know you as much as possible to so help us get to know you. There are lots of people in the room. 
Zaid Ahmed, you were trying to send a private chat to uh, me and Maureen. What is your question? Anybody? Questions, comments, issues? I, I appreciate the time and the expertise. I'm looking forward to signing up for um, uh, one and one and basic. Yes, that, that would be yeah. perfect for you, Samuel. I think that will solve your issue. Complete, you know, it's yeah, like a bullseye right now for you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, folks, questions. We are going to questions, comments. And if Viraj Sarnai yeah. dials in, I'll be happy to listen to your pitch. Yeah, Morin, I am in. I'm. Uh, yes, I am in the call. Yeah. All right, go Mr. ahead. Jim. Go ahead with your presentation, Viraj. Yeah. Uh, hi. So we have a organization named Better Emailing LLC, and we have developed a tool uh, which is uh, for email prioritization. So basically, large organizations or mid-level organizations where there are huge internal emails going on, so it's very hard to identify which are my priority mail. So every employee spends almost 20 odd minutes daily on the mailboxes. So uh, just to make sure the mails are properly prioritized, we have developed a tool. So if you can go down this line, yeah. So yes, this is the problem. Actually, if you get use bulk of email, suppose more than 100 bills are there in my inbox as soon as I uh, open this computer, it, it becomes difficult for me to go through the mail. And that way, overall uh, productivity of the organization is lost and it's also impacting the morale of the employees. So uh, I, may, I might miss many times a priority mails and I might spend my more time uh, on the mails which are not that important. So what we have done, we have developed a system which helps the sender to assign the priority while sending. So if you can go to the next uh, slide, please. Yeah. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you see the screenshot over there, uh, that is our second screenshot. It's a mobile. Uh, we, we have developed a system which is a plugin to the Outlook users. Uh, Outlook is a tool for the employees, the company which are using Outlook for email. They can install a plugin and they can run on the Outlook itself. We have our web app and also the mobile version ready. So basically, emails can be prioritized for each and every individual. And recipients okay. can be prioritized. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, recipients can be prioritized. Uh, so emails can be classified into high priority. In a high priority also, it can be classified as please read, action requested, urgent, or uh, following. And the users can do it either following, sideline it, uh, if they want to redirect it, delegate it. So all the actions are covered in it. And, uh, Miraj, um, what is the pricing model of this? Are you And what is the go-to-market strategy? You're selling to enterprises? Uh, yeah, we'll be selling to uh, medium to large enterprise, and this is a patented technology basically. And pricing model is uh, we'll be charging five dollars per user uh, per month. That's what uh, we are planning. And, and this market the... size that you're quoting here, Sam, Sam, uh, S O M, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. based on a bottom-up analysis based on that pricing model? Uh, yeah, that's true because. Uh, Outlook is a big, big player in the market, and that's based on Outlook users. And other organizations are charging approx eight dollars uh, per uh, per user, and that too they are not covering this feature basically. So if you see, this is the screen of Outlook, uh, and on the right side we have designed this panel. So you can define that uh, conversation action. You can give a proper participant status, and whoever is involved in that conversation will get to know. A person can close that conversation. Open that conversation. So mm -hmm. uh, while sending, you can assign a priority to them. So and this is how the uh, product is. So basically, yes, we are now targeting only the Outlook users, and the TAM, uh, the entire market analysis is done based on the Outlook users as of now. 
Okay. So uh, this is what our revenue uh, revenue model is. We are planning to install 90,000 users by January 2020, and we, the, the flow is going to be uh, go ahead with that. So where are you now? What is the con what is the situation yeah. at the moment? Are you are you selling already? No, I'll tell you. Uh, the product development is done. Uh, the technology is patented. Uh, U.S. and Europe patent is already approved. Uh, international patent is in process. Uh, we, we are in testing phase right now, and we have already uh, done the seed funding stage of $300,000, and now we are looking for more funding for uh, certifications of uh, some security and uh, selling it to the customer. So selling and security certification is our next target, and for that we are looking for funding. I think you're going to need to start selling to be able to raise funding. Uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, actually, we, we are planning that we are uh, we are going live uh, to beta customers soon, but for selling a sort of funds because the security certification is a major take we need to look into because this email is a sensitive stuff and uh, without security certification we we think it's a challenge to get into the big enterprises. But what validation do you have from the big enterprises that they are willing to adopt something like this? Yes. Uh, initially, we had given to eight of the uh, organizations the product which was uh, early ready, but that was just the Outlook version, and they came up with a demand that they wanted the mobile uh, version. Now the mobile things are also ready. Yeah, but I think that there there is an issue with validation. If you're looking for more funding, you you, you okay. said you already raised some funding. Yeah, we had raised uh, three hundred thousand seed funding. And where did you get that for money from? Who funded that? Uh, that that was an investor from the area itself, and that from? was uh, yes. Investor from where? Uh, from California. And so, what, what is it? Is it an institutional investor, a first private investor who knows you? How? What is the? Yeah, who, was who, what kind investor. of an investor is that? Sorry. It was a private investor. A private investor who just wrote a three hundred thousand dollar check. Yeah. And this is somebody you knew from before? Uh, yes, it was through reference. We pitched our idea, he liked it, and he invested. That's how it was. Interesting. Okay. Um, whoa. Uh, Maureen, you're going to need to mute the other line. I think that's where this is coming from. Okay. Um, so, Vijay, I think it's going to be quite difficult without some level of i can understand that you have a, a bottleneck how much bottleneck is this how much uh, how much money is required for you to clear the security issue uh we, yeah we, we we might go for uh some more feed coming on our side that uh, we have a plan for uh two years expenses if we go including security and sales so if, if we if we can get 1.5 million dollars that can uh you can't get $1.5 million until you start selling right now. Right. Given okay. the way the market is set up, I don't think you can get $1.5 million. The question is, if you need security clearance for or, you know, some sort of a security certification to start selling, okay. how much does it cost now for you to get that security certification? Uh, to get the security, it's $150,000. So you need to focus on getting your $150,000 and getting as soon as possible, getting mm -hmm. to selling. You will need to show enterprise accounts that are willing to pay for this to be able to raise a larger round. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's my read of the situation. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you suggest to go for uh, just the security certification cost and get the things done and go for the selling. That's what your suggestion is. Right? Yes. You need to close deals. You need to start showing that enterprises are willing to, you know, spend millions of dollars buying this product. Okay. 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 Yep. And I would go for large enterprises so that you can show that, you know, there are large deals that you can close. Mm -hmm. If you can close one large deal, if you can get the security certification and if you can close one significant enterprise deal, mm -hmm. you will be able to 
get a larger round of fund funding. I can get you a larger round of funding if you can get to that milestone. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll go for that. Then. Yeah. And and even with the selling process, I can get you, uh, you know, to I can help you navigate the, you know, accounts and so forth. But where, where what I cannot do is right now, based on what you're presenting, I cannot commit to getting you one point two million dollars, one point one, one point two million dollars, based on okay. what you have right now. I don't think I'll be able to do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Yeah, I mean, you, you. you're making good progress. You just have to, you know, block and tackle right now. Oh, Salah, thank you. Uh, any any more uh, feedback from you on overall or uh, the concept, the pitch? I would Don't have. put stuff like Series A investment of $5 million. You're not ready anywhere near ready for Series A at the moment. Okay. You're going to have to, you have two more steps. You have to get another seed round to do your security certification. Then you're going to have to sell, close mm -hmm. some business with some credible clients, and then you can go for a Series A. You're nowhere near you're probably six okay. months to nine months away from a series A. So, uh, actually, we we are we we are planning to uh, pick up the activity for a series A simultaneously with this stuff. That's what we are planning. Actually. You can plan anything you want. You have to convince okay. investors to, to give right. you the to write those checks. That's, yeah, that's the true. issue. Yeah, that's true. right, right, right. So it's not it's not entirely up to the investor. I mean, up to the entrepreneur. It has to. You know, it ha there has to be a fit with an investor who's willing to write those checks based on those parameters. And if you can get some friends and family investor, somebody who knows you or your current investors who's willing to do the 150, 200K additional seed round mm -hmm. to get you over the hurdle so that you can start closing significant deals, that's, you know, that's probably mm -hmm. the next step. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That was very nice feedback for us. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Folks, anybody else? Questions, comments, questions by phone, dialing in, questions in the public chat? Yes, no? Introductions? Where are you coming from? What brings you here? Are you finding this helpful? Yeah, this is. I would like to put my comments on that. This is Viraj here again. Yes, go ahead, Viraj. Uh, yeah, this is a great platform and uh, the great work you people are doing. I would say because such kind of feedbacks are very important for people like us. And as as, as you gave us a feedback that go for it, and that was a very uh, important thing that we get to know at this stage itself. Uh, great. So it's, it's better to get the right feedback at right time, and you people are doing a great work and thought. And thanks for that. Excellent. Glad to hear that you find it useful. Anybody else, folks? Questions, comments? Ah, um, So I have a private question from Joyce Shanahan about what um, nonprofit uh, funders should be doing. Joyce, no, we don't really do nonprofits. So nonprofit funding is a very different uh, set of issues, and 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 the the way things work is very different. I don't, I haven't really spent any time thinking about how to get nonprofits funded through foundations and so forth. So at the moment, you know, as you know, our hands are full, right? We're doing one million by one million. We are doing all kinds of things to help the for profit entrepreneurs in technology and technology enabled services. And for the moment. Until we hit one million by one million, our target, I don't want to take on more things. So this is my choice as far as our focus is concerned. You know, our niche, our, and it's a large niche. There are lots of entrepreneurs who are trying to build technology companies as for profit companies. So I don't really want to deviate from that at the moment. So we are not the best place for nonprofits to, you know, seek help.
Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? All right, folks. I don't see any more questions. We have covered quite a lot of ground. Think about what you've heard today. And um, if you like the format and if you want more of it, while you know, of course, you can come back to the live roundtables, but do use the recordings. They are all available for you in, on YouTube. The investor interviews and entrepreneur interviews that we do at the beginning of the session in a talk show mode, all those are available as um, podcasts as well. So go, uh, you know, listen to all this stuff. If you have commute, try to use your commute time effectively and uh, and come see me. If you're either in the Bay Area or visiting the Bay Area, come see me at one of the, uh, you know, rendezvous on Wednesday afternoons. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.